Let's now look at the concept of integrals, and let me start with the indefinite integrals. Once more, I stress that this is the exact inverse operator compared to derivatives. And you probably have some intuition or reminiscence that while derivatives were easy, I give you a function and by those, uh, if you want mechanical and a little bit mnemonic um, operations, you can derive any uh, function. You can write the derivative of any function. Going in the opposite direction might be a little bit more complicated. So say that I give you the following task. What is the function such that if I take its derivative, I obtain f of x here? This is the concept of indefinite integral, and it's indicated by this symbol and by the so-called uh, uh, integration variable, which is x, and it's expressed here by conventionally by dx. In other words, what I'm asking is to specify the function f of x, or for what it matters, f of x plus any constant, such that if I take the derivative, I get the original integrand function, the argument of the integral. And please note that the story of a constant is not difficult at all. The derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives, and the derivative of a constant is zero. So whatever you, uh, you, you place here, it's uh, not contributing or not changing the answer to my question, which is the integral of f of x. So similarly to what I've done for the derivatives of elementary functions, I would like to provide you with a list of integrals, which is worth to memorize. And you can very easily verify that these are correct by simply applying the derivative on the uh, on this side of these equations. For instance, the derivative of a constant is a linear function plus arbitrary constant. The derivative of a linear function is a parabola, is a square function, with exception of this uh, factor one half which is uh, used to compensate for the fact, you remember that rule, that the exponent 2 is actually moving, is actually moving at the beginning. In the case of the uh, generic exponent n, you actually find or might find this derivation very uh, reasonable. For the 1 over x, you remember that the associated function is the log, and for the exponential you will also remember the uh, property of the uh, exponential that once you take the derivative, it remains the same. And here I also indicated quickly the integrals of the sine and cosine functions. Indeed, here I'm asking not any intuition, but rather a little bit of memory of the elementary functions and their derivatives and how these rules for uh, concatenating or combining functions, summing, subtracting, dividing, could be uh, used to guess the solution of an integral. Throughout the course, we are never going to make integrals that are particularly difficult. And we are always following an approach which will be called heuristic. I might provide you with a solution of the integral or provide you with a, with a way to guess the solution of the integral, and so no genius answer is required from you, at least at this stage. Let me conclude with the concept of definite integrals, refreshing the fundamental theorem of integral calculus. Now, mathematicians were interested in calculating areas. And this, by the way, turns to be of immense importance in a variety of real-world applications. Said you have a generic function f of x, whose graph is represented here on the left. And say that you want to calculate the area within a specific interval between, say, a and b. a and b are numbers, minus 5 and plus 15, for instance. One possible way is to subdivide this interval in n small bins or small intervals, which have uh, equal width, say, measuring delta x, and that goes from, say, the first element to the element number n, covering the range a to b. Now, the real area 
assuming that by convention you take the area positive whenever the function is positive and negative whenever the function is negative, can be approximated as the area of a series of rectangles, which is indicated here. And each rectangle gives a better approximation whenever delta x is taken smaller and smaller and smaller. Of course, if you take delta x smaller and smaller, even the number of the bins is going to increase and ultimately it's going to be an infinite amount of bins. So let me consider this first small rectangle. It is centered around x of k, where k is uh, just a parameter running from 1 to n. So you have x of 1, x of 2, x of n. Then the area of this rectangle is given by base times the height, and the height is f calculated in that point. So if I want to calculate the area, I have to accumulate the area of that rectangle, the rectangle to its immediate right, the rectangles uh, further corresponding to the bin k plus 2 and k plus 3, and so on and so forth, including both the rectangle on the left and on the right, concluding with f of a times delta x and f of b times delta x. The smaller you make delta x, and of course the more terms you will have to add here, so it will be quite boring and time-consuming, the better, however, will be your approximation to the area. Now, if you allow me to use a very compact notation, mathematical notation, involving this Greek symbol sigma to express concisely the same thing, the sum, I can say that the sum from k equals to 1 to n of the generic area of the generic rectangle f of x of k times delta x will give me this area of the uh, all these series of rectangles. Now it turns out that the integral and the area here are related and perhaps you might have noticed that the symbol of the integral and the symbol of sum sigma are not that far apart. The concept that I introduced and refreshed a moment ago about the indefinite integral has to be complemented by the so-called integration extremes, or the range of integration, making explicit and along within which range the function is integrated. So the integral is therefore a kind of limit of the sum whenever the delta x is getting so small that it gets infinitesimal and the number is getting number of bins is getting infinite. So that's the reason why here, just in terms of notation, you have that dx survived to indicate or to quantify the variable of integration, but also maintaining some kind of consistency in terms of, for instance, measuring unit. It is still an area, it's still a product of the f of x values times the interval, the uh, delta x. Indeed, you can consider the integral as a kind of limiting process of the sum. A limiting process where the number of these beans is basically exploding, is going to infinite. So there is an infinitely large number of these beans, each with an infinitesimal side. So you actually see that these delta x, in terms of purely of notation, corresponds to the dx, more or less like what we've seen in the case of the incremental ratio. And then you still have the some kind of uh, extremes A and B, like there were the extremes of, of changes of the index K. And finally, also the dimension of this product is in a way is preserved. Here it was very clear, it was a product of the height times a base, like a rectangle, like the area of the rectangle. This is preserved here. Let me remind you in the case of indefinite integrals, which is, was a different, there was no extremes of integration here, what is the so-called primitive function? The function such that if you take its derivative, you get the argument of the integral. If I know the uh, primitive, this f of x plus, plus, uh, times, uh, sorry, plus a constant, I can immediately calculate, according to the theorem of integral calculus, this area by taking the primitive and calculating in the upper extreme and subtracting 
the value of the primitive computed in the lower extreme. You probably notice that the constant is basically cancelling since it's the same both in this and in that term. So the knowledge of primitives is extremely powerful. And I would like, just in terms of notation, to mention that during the course, we might sometimes encounter the case in which an integral of a perfect uh, differential is encountered. In other words, I know precisely that I have a primitive function such that the derivative is f of x. And once more in terms of notation, I'm using the Leibniz notation here, and here I'm just uh, using the dx, which is intrinsic in the notation. It's purely typographic notation of the, of the integral. Somehow, in a very imprecise and approximate way, you could consider as if this dx is somehow simplifying because of the product and the ratio for the same quantity. And what remains is a df, so it's somehow a delta, which is here indicated here. It's a delta, it's an increment. In other words, what I'm trying to invoke is the definition of a derivative just before applying the limit. And similarly, the definition of definite integral just before taking the limitative and maintaining the sum. What remains is somehow consistent in terms of uh, simplification of conventional algebra. As a final note, I would like to point out that the integral of a quantity of a function that is, for instance, always positive within a given interval or a changing sign would have an impact on the value of that definite integral. Remembering, for instance, that the, whenever the function is positive, the area is considered conventionally as positive. If the other extreme of integration b was not here but was moved instead here towards negative values of x, you would see immediately and you would be able to predict that the integral of f of x between, say, a and b located here in this point that I'm indicating with the pointer would be a positive number. On the other hand, if I could move a here and b here, wherever in the range where f is negative, I could immediately predict that the definite integral of f of x would give rise to a negative quantity, to a negative number. The area is just a negative number. As mentioned before, in case you want to refresh more fundamental concept behind integrals and derivatives, I point you to these online resources that have been very useful for me in preparing this uh, mathematical refresher.